Hey, I'm Jesse. We're in Acts chapter 17. Let's begin in verse 22. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observed the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made this world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Wow, that's an introduction to the gospel. Can we take a second and zoom out Acts wide so far and just observe the different ways in which Paul would open up the gospel. The first time we really saw it, it got harsh. He was going toe to toe with a dude who claimed to be a sorcerer. And that was, that was pretty rough. That was confrontational. That was gruff. Sometimes, believe it or not, that actually does work well in the Christian context. I've seen this. I've met skeptics and atheists and sometimes Mormons who think of Christians as pushovers, it seems, like we're just marshmallows. And they don't realize, like, no, man, we, we know the truth himself. And so sometimes it's good to be adamant. But look in this context. Paul was very different. Paul actually began with their pagan literal platform and used it as a segue into the gospel. We see him speak from general revelation earlier in the, in the book of Acts, describing God as the one who made everything, even the joy and the food that fill us. He, he goes from a Jewish context, speaking about Jesus as the fulfillment of the promise made through David, the one whose throne would never end. Depending on his audience, he never changes the gospel. But the bridge that he takes to get to the gospel is adapted qua his audience. And here in Athens, he opens up by commending them. I see that you're a very religious people. They had invited this, by the way. All they did was talk about new ideas. They were obsessed with it. Can you relate to that? Can you imagine anything else? Can you imagine, I don't know, some sort of platform where the people of the world can come together and constantly crave what's new and a naturally forming algorithm promotes novelty. Me neither. This is what Paul did before the Athenians and he meets them where they're at and then he brings them to the gospel. He was confrontational where that was necessary. He was historically Jewish where that was necessary and here he even begins from a pluralistic standpoint but he does not compromise the gospel one iota. Okay, listen to me. I've seen God lead militant atheists and devout fifth generation pagans to faith in Christ. And I have never seen anyone saved by a watered down gospel presentation. Do not, do not, do not compromise Jesus alone on the cross and his resurrection as Lord. Don't ever compromise the core of the gospel. Don't excise the repentance from sin to the fine print. Don't ever even leave it open for suggestion that maybe their pagan God could be the true God or could sit and play nicely alongside the one true God. That would be lying. That would be a surefire way to condemn your friend to hell forever. But do meet them where they're at and bring them to the truth. You will lose some people along the way, but your objective is not to persuade. You're not a salesman doing a pitch. You're an evangelist sharing the one true thing that saves people. So don't you dare compromise that truth. Look at Paul's approach and see if you can spot the point at which he did lose some because they were pretty open-minded at first, but it's not gonna stay that way for long. He met them in their open-mindedness, spoke in terms they would originally understand, and then brought them along. And you can see that he does so in a way that is perfectly faithful to the innate exclusivity of the Christian gospel. Yeah, you missed one God, and he's the only true God. 
He's the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. He, he even speaks to the diversity of different cultures so that people would reach out to him. He knows, as he will reveal in Romans chapter 1, that in their hearts they know. They secretly know. They've always known, because of everything that's been made, they've always known about God's divine power and eternal nature. And he uses their altar to an unknown God as the platform upon which he builds the gospel for them in a way that they understand. He is exclusive about the truth of Christianity, but he begins at a point of resonance. This is phenomenal and it's beautiful. It's a great way to resonate. It's not going to be 100% effective. There are gonna be some people who join him and there are gonna be some people who shoot him down. All right, there are gonna be some people who say, we'd like to learn more about this. And there are gonna be some people who follow Paul, but then there are gonna be some people who really get mad about this. In fact, the Epicureans and the Stoics, because of this, are gonna go about their plot to infiltrate the church with their false gospels and with their false teachings providing the impetus for the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Christian, meet people where they're at. Find the kernel of truth in what they believe. Commend them for that, and then draw a bridge directly to the gospel. This is what Paul did for the Athenians. It still works today. This is the book of Acts. It is so still happening today, isn't it? So, go live out the book of Acts. Are you ready? Go.